Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, heroes and villains. I'm your host, Deshaun Fauntleroy. I know your time is precious, so we're going to get right into today's show. Episode 35 featuring Dr. Daniel E. Walker. Show notes, links, conversation and more at sportsmastery.com slash 35. Dr. Walker's bio, it reads like a novel. And as you'll learn later, you can see how he's uh, impacted a lot of people in the Southern, in the community of Southern California. This gentleman is an internationally acclaimed scholar, artist, and social entrepreneur working in the fields of history, film, religion, education, digital archives, and theater. At age 19, Walker, as a sophomore at San Diego State University with a fellow friend, founded Leadership Excellence, a nonprofit organization that utilizes college students to teach leadership and academic skills to urban youth. The organization annually placed over 97% of its high school participants in accredited colleges and universities and is the subject of the book Black Youth Rising, Activism and Radical Healing in Urban America. He was also elected student government president at San Diego State University, holding a BA in psychology from San Diego State University, an MA in distinction in Latin American history, and a PhD in Latin American and African American history. Walker is the author of the critically acclaimed book, No More, No More, Slavery and Cultural Resistance in Havana and New Orleans, and served as a research associate at the University of Southern California Center for Religion and Civic Culture from 2004 to 2016. In today's episode, Dr. Walker will be discussing student-athlete academic preparation, personal branding, mindset, leadership, educational aspirations, and being progressive and proactive. But before we get to that, I want to talk to you, the audience, personally. What are you struggling with? What can I personally help you with? And what I mean by that is if you have questions for me, if you're going through a hardship right now, I want you to email me, Deshaun, D-E-S-H-A-W-N at sportsmastery.com. What's bothering you right now? What are you struggling with? What are your pains and fears? What can I do to help you? I also wanna ask the audience this, what would you like to hear more of? What subjects would you like to hear more of? What topics would you like me to discuss? Are you a student? Are you a parent? Are you a coach? Feel free to email me. I want you to. We're 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 getting we're 35 episodes in. My goal right now is to keep this show going. I can appreciate everybody that's been on the show so far. I really appreciate all the listeners taking the time to download these uh these episodes and as you share my episodes and the subject matter that we've been discussing for the last 35 weeks, just know that what you're doing is really helping this show grow to a place that I never thought imaginable in such a short amount of time. So I want to thank you, but be sure to let me know what your pains and fears are. Let me know how, how I can personally help you. If I have to, that might be a 30 to 45 minute phone call from me, but I need you to reach out. Send me an email. Let me know what your pains and fears are. Let me know what you're struggling with. Please tell me what would you like to hear more of? What topics would you like me to discuss? Who would you want me to bring on? Do you have any ideas? Forward those ideas to me. Forward the contact information to me. And you had uh, some things come up with, was that with UCLA? That was actually with USC. With with USC? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about that. That was uh, you getting a a potential position as a professor there? Oh, no, no. This is, um, so I work with a group of people who all are, we're, we're filmmakers and creatives, but we're also advocates for um, increasing the space for people of color within entertainment and digital media. So yes. we were meeting at USC with this thing called the Institute for Creative Technology, and we're positioning a group to do a it's – a, it's, a, it's actually a joint project between the Department of Defense and USC, the okay. Institute for Creative Technology. And what they do is it's virtual reality. And so they initially started off as something that creates, you know, trying to model for simulations for, you can imagine, defense, um, fighting, all the rest of the stuff, air simulation, all these. But then about 10 years ago, realized that both gaming and entertainment were um, 
sometimes ahead of them and then sometimes behind them. So they created this center that's basically, you know, in the middle of Hollywood that is opposed to, in addition to doing all the stuff you would think that a defense contractor would want to do around virtual reality simulation, like I say, fighting to airplanes, to whatever else, to also being the people who, when Paul Walker died for the last Fast and Furious movie, created the right. digital simulation for who he was. Or... Um, do all kinds of things to where they solve problems that Hollywood creatives are trying to figure out. So they really have this, you know, it's like a one foot in both categories. And actually, you know, defense in the way that you think defense related now, a lot of it is dealing with like simulations for people with post-traumatic stress, all kinds of things that they come back and have to have some new way of kind of modeling so that they can begin to move in the world. So what we were doing and what we've been uh, working on is a contract with them to do this program this summer where we have 25 black and Latino students who are able to intern there the entire summer and literally, you know, be at the cutting edge of what is the cutting edge of, of digital reality, which is virtual reality and augmented reality. So it was a really, really cool opportunity for us to get literally the people from the Department of Defense were there, the SC people, um, Kevin Hart Studio is, is looking like it's going to be a part of it too. And okay. it was just it, it was just a lot of convergence of things coming together at the right time and it was like can you move now and it was like yes right. <laughs> i will be there so it, it was good stuff even just watching I, I hadn't been to the center and just watching them be able to like take a picture of me and then turn me into a virtual thing and then have me on the screen and then show me walking through environments and even catching everything like inflections of face you know uh, intonations smiling you know uh, affective feelings all that and i know in your work with um sports marketing and sport i mean sports um modeling and sports uh mastery training. and everything about yeah training you know, you start thinking about all these different kind of ways in which a simulated reality may be able to help somebody who maybe can't come to your center or be with you directly. But if you could create a virtual world for them to be able to go through training or to be able to go through the mental gymnastics that they need to have to go through to be able to then perform uh, on the field or on the court at the time they need to, it's going back to that kind of visioning thing of going over it over and over again, putting yourself in that situation. And then how are you going to react? And maybe if you've done it you know, in this other way, a hundred different times, uh, when the game is on the line and the clock is ticking down, the person's able to hit the shot. Um, you know, bef I, I want to talk about, you sent me, uh, the changing the game program. Yes. That's something I'd like to discuss, but before we get to that, you, you have, uh, I went to your website and I was able to check out the life lesson of me and the watermelon. Yeah. Would you care to explain that to the audience? Because I really enjoyed it. I've watched it like four or five times since I first saw it. But I really appreciate that. And I think kids in the inner city going off to college or who happen to be fortunate enough to have the academics and sporting skills to take them to different environments. This is something that they need to know and understand. Yeah, well, thank you for that. So, yeah, me and the watermelon was just really a scenario where I'm trying to think about you know, when we, especially for those of us who are of color, maybe low income, or sometimes come into a new environment where there's an expectation, um, positive or negative, of what we represent. So in the case of an athlete going on to a college campus and people thinking because you're an athlete, you only can do A, B, or C, and maybe you don't have the capacity to do D, E, and F. And the notion was this this thing about watermelons. And I, I, I talked about the fact that, you know, growing up, I really loved watermelon. It was my thing. I loved it. Yeah, I just did one of my favorite fruits ever. <laughs> and, and, and I, and I loved it. Just, I just did. But then I got into college and especially when I became elected to student body president, San Diego state, and I was the first African American. When I went into new environments, many times I'd be the only person of color in the environment. And then I became hypersensitive to what others perceptions of black people and black men were. So I literally uh, talk about going into, let's say, a reception where they would have a fruit plate and they'd have watermelon there. And I wouldn't eat the watermelon because I felt like whites believe that all black people love chicken, watermelon and basketball. And so right. 
<laughs> I was going to not conform into their stereotype and have them, you know, I just wasn't going to do it. So after a while, I started, you know, I was in so many of these environments that I stopped. I, I literally stopped saying that I liked watermelon, literally, because that was almost my thing. No, I don't like watermelon almost to say all black people don't like watermelon. So I don't like watermelon. Right. And, right. and after a while, it got to where I didn't eat watermelon for like 10 years. Um, being so conscious of it. And then I tell the story of then when my wife at the time got uh, pregnant and she was craving, she craved one thing and that was watermelon. And I would go to the store and get the watermelon for her and present it for her. And I still was being, you know, a, a taboo, keeping my mind and my lips off that watermelon. And then one night I, 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 I felt that watermelon coming, uh, calling me. And I went downstairs and I finally uh, cut it open and and, and began to eat it and everything rushed back into me. The joy, the time I used to have with my cousin sitting out on the porch, my, my mother, my grand, everything you can think of all came back to me. And I began to realize that here I was concerned so much about what somebody else believed about me that I was denying myself. I was denying myself everything I was denying myself something that was actually um, a joy for me because I was so concerned about the perceptions that other people had. And I realized that that was the key for so many of us, which is it's hard. I call it warring against your past. Like many of us to get to where, to get to the college campus, sometimes you got to fight so many of your, you, you, uh, some people call them demons, but I just call it your past or your, your situations. You got to sometimes yes. just getting to school is getting past a neighborhood of challenges. Um, getting through class is a neighborhood of challenges and then finally getting to that new place. And sometimes to get there, we've had to deny a lot of things that we felt might get us caught up. And many times we then get into the situation and we're not even our truest self anymore because we've shaved so many pieces of ourself away just to kind of get there. And that place where you get to is really, really not a cool place to be because you're not being your fullest self. So you're not being your best self. Yeah, I agree, man. What I found incredible about the uh, the watermelon story was that I work with kids every day and I have a handful of kids that are 4.0 students, 3.7 students, 3.5. And they often get a lot of peer pressure for basically being nerds that happen to be athletes. And then on top of that, you know, they like to train anywhere from three, four, sometimes five days a week. And they'll train in the season one to two times a week. So they get a lot of flack from their peers being called nerds or things. Thinking that they're uh, pl playing sports to go professional and they get teased a lot from the kids that might show up to a party, might arrive in a stolen car, just might happen to get into a gunfight and get half halfway shot in the face, starting fires at school and then getting expelled. So those are some of the and you know, you you work with athletes and yeah. student athletes that uh, see those types of peer pressures. But I think the story that you have that it, it definitely epitomizes just be yourself and be who you are and love yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's it. And honestly, that's what really got you to where you are. <laughs> you know, it, 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 we, we begin to start recreating or trying to create something else. And it's actually what made you who you are. I mean, I, I, you know, people can have their own impressions of it. But I use an example of somebody like Alan Iverson, who, mm -hmm. who, you know, you think about it, all the things he's got to go through. He's got this court case and a jail sentence before he even gets to Georgetown, right? Uh, right. He, go, he goes through all these things where he's the number one basketball and football player in the nation, right? And yes, he was an outstanding quarterback. Exactly, exactly. And and many people, you know, a freakishly crazy quarterback. I mean, that dude was, was, was out of this world. And then he gets caught up in a situation. And it's a, it's a brawl at a bowling alley. And because he's who he is, it's very obvious that people are singling him out of all these people and he could have easily when he got sentenced to jail i mean you imagine seeing everything falling i mean falling yes. i mean crumbling um and then you know court and 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 the love of a coach like a john thompson who said i'm going to be there because this young man needs me in his life, not necessarily that he needs a coach and stayed right. through the process with him. And then the guy gets to Georgetown, one of the top 15 colleges in America, does everything he's supposed to do on the court and gets to the pros. And at a certain point, 
you know, his swag, I'll use that word, his style, his flow, his everything was actually what got him through all that. It was that moxie, that never die attitude that despite all obstacles, I'm going to still make it even in the middle of a prison cell that got him there. And then he finally realized, if you look at his rookie card, you know, he's clean cut, all the rest of the stuff, no tats. And then he went to the tats and the braids and everybody freaks out. But this was what the smallest dude in the league, basically, you know, other than Muggsy Bogues and maybe Spud Webb still at the same time, uh, has to do because that's how he got there. And once he put on his swag suit, I'll call it. I mean, what is it? MVP, four time, you know, scoring champ, all the rest of the stuff. And he could have tried to be the other person, but it was that almost, you know, energizer bunny. You hit him. He keeps coming back. He keeps coming back. He keeps coming back. And that's what made him special was that he was his own man. And sometimes it'll, it, it can be a negative for you, but it was he's his own person. He's owning his own skin. And of course, he changed. He learned some things being in Georgetown. He learned some things through going to jail. Those are two quite opposite kind of ends of the continuum in a two year period. Right. To go from yes, being yes, literally is. in the penitentiary to being on the hill, as they call it, at Georgetown and all that. There's something in the middle that was, man, this is the thing that has got me from this neighborhood I grew up in, from all the other challenges, from drug possibilities, everything. It's been that I am me. I'm unique and different. And we can shave some things off of us, but the core is, what do we think about Iverson? We think about a person who never gives up. You know, yes. You you know he's going against seven footers. He coming right back, <laughs> right back in the lane. Here I go. What you gonna do? <laughs> you know. So I, I just think that you know sometimes there's a core of who we are. It's hard sometimes to figure it out, especially for a lot of young men, especially if they're good at athletics, but then also really good in the classroom. You know, people are gonna say things, and in the in the big picture, I mean, there's a swag of being an intellectual. I, I, I kill it on these math tests. That's what I do. You know, <laughs> I think growing up, that was my whole thing. I'm not the biggest guy, anything like that. But I started to just love. I was like, people, people know I'm smart and that's all right. And I'm going to kill this curve, <laughs> you know? And, <laughs> and after a while, I started realizing I had more cheerleaders than I had haters. And I mean, you know, going to a predominantly yep. white school, you know, a lot of the black kids who went there were, um, you know, uh, like me, poor on welfare, everything else. But they started really being my cheerleaders because it was like, we know Daniel was fighting the fight for us, right? That he's going to be the one on the stage at graduation. And they could all gain and get some joy and some um, uplift from he's our dude. And when I went off to college, it was the same thing. It was like my whole little city was still rooting for me. So for those young brothers who are trying to, you know, navigate that, you know, own it, own that you're smart, own that you are representing your community by being smart. And I guarantee you the cheerleaders will outweigh the haters when in the long term. I agree, man. I I, pre- I appreciate what you said about the Allen Iverson story and Coach John Thompson, man, is as far as being a mentor and his advocate, being a father figure, uncle, coach, friend. You know, a lot of times I tell kids, if you're going to go to a school, even in high school, get to know the coach, make an attempt. I tell the parents, make an attempt to get to know the coach. See if that coach is going to interact with you. See if he gives you personal calls. Does he invite you into the office, you know, uh, to talk about your son and daughter? Do y'all all all three or four of you, do y'all get together? Because that it's beyond the sport. And if they don't care about you as a person and as a student, I'm not sure that coach, that's, that's probably not a good school situation or coach to be involved with. And for me, I tell kids, Play for someone who loves you as a person first. And when it t- when it comes time going off to, you know, uh, the university setting, use those same. Let's use the same tactics and ask those uh, those questions, because we all have to have people that care for us, whether it's a mentor, a coach, whatever role or roles that they play. It has to be more than about the sport yeah. Yeah. And, and listening to your experience. If you can remember who was that impactful person for you that was a mentor or somebody said, you know what, you can do this, or they believed in you? It's a, uh, his name is Dr. Danny Scarborough. And actually I'll send you a link uh, for the, my film that I made about him. Um, 
it was, he was, so I got to San Diego State as a freshman. I, like I said, I grew up in a town that was predominantly white, uh, that had the Klan. Um, there were only 17 of us African Americans in a class of about 600 who graduated. And even though I had grown up in the little black section of this little place called Fontana, um, it was a really, really small space. And I I got to San Diego State, and here the school was bigger than my town, <laughs> straight out. It was bigger than the town I lived in, and and it was overwhelming. It, it, it was. And I ended up taking a class, and his name was, like I said, his name was Dr. Danny Scarborough, and he was a literature instructor, but he also taught this dance group, and it was called the San Diego State Black Repertory Total Theatrical Experience, a mouthful, right? Okay. So this dude was, you know, he 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 was a trip. So he taught English. He assigned 13 books for the semester. That was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You had to go buy 13 books. <laughs> you know, and just the fact that he was going to expect that we were going to read 13 books in a semester. That was I was going, that's like a book a week. What you know, you can't expect that of me, but he was expecting that of us. And it was this African-American studies literature class. The majority of students were black and he was already setting the academic uh, standard really, really high. And in addition, he ran this dance group where he took average regular students. They didn't have to be dance majors. As a matter of fact, the majority of them were not. And he, he would take them and kind of mold them into this this dance troupe that ended up touring all around the United States won an Emmy. And on the dance floor, I never was in the dance group, but they were, I mean, he was this coach. That's what he was. And he was pushing and it was, I mean, it was dance, but he would get football players, you know, Kappas, Alphas, Sigmas, you know, dudes on it, 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 all out there dancing because he was challenging them, honestly, with this issue of like, manhood, leadership, physicality, everything that you think about that a coach would do. You think you somebody, come on here, can you handle it? You know, you think, okay, you think you're the wide receiver, okay. Can you handle, you know, a six-hour dance rehearsal where you got to lift this woman up, you got to do this, you got to stay in sync with somebody else. I mean, it was uh, amazing. And he was the type of person who would challenge you like crazy about your intellect. He would challenge you on your physicality. He would challenge you on your commitment to your people, to the community. And he just, he, he, I had never seen a black man that, that living so full in all of his gifting. Like, you know, like he's unafraid to be smart. He's unafraid to be masculine. He's unafraid to be artistic. He was unafraid to be a spokesperson for the community and everything else. And he just instilled in me and hundreds of other people that came through there who were in a school system where here you are at this big university, only 1.5% of the population were, were black students. You're walking in classrooms where there's only white students and you're the only black student. And you, you, if you got any hangups, they're starting to work through yourself all over again, you know? Right. <laughs> you know? Right. And, 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 and it was almost like, I've realized this now and retrospect that it was only in essence he was saying and here's a place where you can excel and it might be on this dance floor because that may be the only thing you think you're doing properly on this campus right now because you know your biology class you you don't feel like you fit in you don't feel like you fit in in chemistry and it created a community and when they won the emmy it was like the whole university was like oh my god these people are special so now these students are walking around like I'm an Emmy winning you get where I'm going from it's just like being yes, on the football yes. field and you win the national championship you're walking around like yeah or the league championship or we're in the bowl game they, it was it was that for folk and then the other interesting thing about him is he's the only he's the first person I also ever knew who died of AIDS Okay. So wow. when I was a senior, um, he 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 told the world that he had AIDS. He was on the cover of uh, Ebony magazine um, in uh, March of 1989, and he he told the world that he was bisexual and that he um, had contracted AIDS not by a transfusion but by having unsafe sex. And so he was being blunt and straight and being a. a a champion. And then he died, I think it was in May of 89, 
But in the research for the movie um, that I did, I did a short film and I'm completing a feature film. Hopefully it'll be done in the next few months. I, I, I found his medical records and I found out that he had been diagnosed with AIDS in 1984. Okay. Interesting thing was I said he died in 18 and 1989, but I didn't right. get to San Diego state till 1985. So okay. I realized that the whole time this guy was dying, he was, he was helping me how to live. live. Yes. So everything that I've known of him, the only experience I ever had him, he had AIDS. He was dying. This was before, you know, the medicines you have now. This is before. So as opposed to checking out, you get where I'm coming from? He could have just said, forget yes. this. This dude was on fire until his body gave out. He was inspirational, uh, uplifting, challenging, all that stuff. And I realized that th the dude was dying. I mean, he was literally, every, I only have known him when he had AIDS. I didn't know him before. He had already had it by the time I first met him. And to see somebody living with as much of zest and commitment and, and inspiration, all that stuff. And to know that he was, oh man, that's dude. It keeps me when I'm when I'm, uh, when I think, you know how it is, man, you're in this world of encouraging, you're an entrepreneur and you know what? Sometimes the finances don't come through the way you want it to. You, you know what your mission is, but it gets tiring. <laughs> you know, you're looking at that bank account and the check supposed to come, didn't come. And you don't want to be, uh, 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 you don't want to the person who owes it to you, the entity, you, you can't really get mad because you need it to come. So you have to maintain the business relationship, but your rent right. is due. <laughs> and sometimes it even feels like you're helping and somebody's not being appreciative of your help. Yes. And you feel, I feel like, man, I'm going to check out of this. You know, I could just be safe, be a college professor. Don't worry about all the rest of this stuff. Just collect my check and move and on. be comfortable. And then I think about Dr. Scarborough, because if he would have thought about that, he would have never been there to inspire me. And I wouldn't be who I am if he would have just said, I got AIDS, I'm going to die. So I might as well just take a trip to Bermuda and, you know, uh, you know, and, and forget all this. Collect my check as a professor. I don't I can come in, teach my three or four classes and walk on about my business, you know, but he didn't. And every time I get, um, you know, weary and 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 things aren't working as fast as I want them to work, or it seems like it's not going to work. I plop in that <laughs> little ten minute movie I made and <laughs> and realize I ain't got no excuse. <laughs> right. I have no excuse. I have no excuse. I have no excuse. I have no excuse. You know, I feel like I feel like when you're uh, when your goal is to aspire to do something great or you just have a general goal in particular and you know you have the short term, the the uh, mid range goals and the long term and you know that you're on that path, there's going to be times where you just want to stop. You just want to quit. Like I felt that before and I feel like every person is going to go through that on their journey. And that's what I talk to my kids about. Just embrace the journey. It's a process. We have to go through it. You're going to have some setbacks. But it's like what you talked about earlier. It's like having mentors or guides in place, especially if you have somebody that's been there so they can share with you systems and strategies that when you come into an obstacle, we show you how to move that obstacle or go around it or jump over it or do something to where we can continue progress. And that's what I hear from you uh, explaining the story regarding Dr. Scarborough. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's it. And when you talked about like mentors to help you with strategies and systems, uh, for, for anybody, I don't care what race they are, even economic situations. When you get on that college campus, it's a big, it's a whole new world. <laughs> you, you've come from your high school where you knew the teachers because you've been around them for four years. You knew people because you may have been going to school with somebody since you were in kindergarten. And then all of a sudden you get to this place where you don't know anybody. And you walk out on that dorm floor the first time and they're doing all the activities to try to get you to, 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 to be acclimated. But sometimes you just don't feel it. 
And then when you're trying to figure out how do I access these systems and resources, the most important thing is you've got to find a mentor. You've got to find, as you talked about, even when the coaching staff, someone who loves you and cares about your growth and well-being, somebody who cares that, you know, you may be feeling homesick in week seven or eight after the shine of the school has worn off and you're from California or the West Coast and the weather has changed in Minnesota. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) And you looking at this thing as... uh, you know, that, that, that this ain't what it was cracked up to be or the depth chart isn't what you wanted it to be. And you realize that they recruited three other people at the same position as you. And you, you feel like maybe the coaches betrayed you um, because they've, in essence, sold you this false bill of goods that you were going to be this and that. And everybody at home is rooting for you, but it's just not working the same. Or you're the left tackle and that guy gets past you every single time. And in high school, they never got past you. You've got to figure out some new strategies to be able to uh, make this happen. And still, it's the process, as you said. You've got to be able to say, I am here today. I'm going to be someplace else four years from now. I've got to find somebody. and I've got to reach out. That's office hours. That may be the coach who may not be the, the one that everybody thinks is the one you should impress, but it's the one who's the academic advisor who's actually going to be at that college even when the coaching change happens which will happen <laughs> right. while you're there and you don't have to lose your mind because the coach left for a better job or you guys went one in 15 and he's gone because, you know, he got fired. Um, you're creating some other networks on that campus that care about your health and well-being, that care about you graduating. And if that's talking to other people on the dorm floor, if that's the RA, if that's the person in Africana studies or your department, if it's business or whatever, um, I always tell athletes the most important thing is to get out of that athletic circle on campus Um, because that world is all false and you've got to make connections with regular everyday students who not only see who don't just see you as the person they're paying their tuition to go and watch on Saturdays but the person who cares about you because you're just a student like them and you have a paper due in econ and you're all just working on it as students They've got to make those connections because once again, the coaching stuff is going to change. If you have success, it's going to change because the coach is going to go someplace else um, unless you're at Ohio State and one of the two other places in America. And if you're not so good, coaching change is going to happen because uh, the way college athletics runs today, they don't keep nobody for four years if they lose for four years. So the only thing that's going to keep you is the connections with the person in student services who lives in the city. And that's where they they went to college they gonna be there this is their job for the next 30 years the person in the residence halls the people you came in with those individuals because it it it's it, it i think students have to begin to understand especially athletes that the big picture of the economics of college especially division one college sports is that four years is a long time in that world and you can't lose for four years in a row and stay. And if you're at anything as a mid-major or anything like that, you can't win for four years and stay because if you win for four years in a row, you are going to get called by Ohio State or Michigan or UCLA or whatever else. And the athlete is sitting there with no other support system because everybody else has left. So the athlete has to do their due diligence and see and, and, and understand the history, maybe the last four to five seasons of the school where the coach has been before. And, you know, uh, looking at the horizon yeah. before you make that uh, life, that life changing decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That hot coach is nice, but it ain't nice for you if you're a freshman, because that hot coach is not going to be at Southwest Missouri State for four years. It's not going to (laughs) happen. They're going to go on to Missouri. (laughs) Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Dr. Daniel E. Walker, a filmmaker, scholar, social entrepreneur, dynamic public speaker. It took me a month to track this gentleman down and get him on the show due to his busy schedule. This is a five star show. Go to iTunes. Rate this five stars. Don't be the person that rates this four stars, three stars, two stars or one star. This is a five star individual. He's a he's an outstanding character in the community of how helping not only black men succeed, but 
anybody who wants to take that next that next step forward. Dr. Walker is the man. I'll be listing all of his contact information, his bio and everything you want to know in the links and with with links and show notes on our show notes page. Dr. Walker, I wanted to switch lanes for a second and discuss personal branding, looking at the high school or college student before they make that transition into the real world, be it uh, their their uh, career, their work career or to the sporting world. Express that, because I know that's part of uh, your program is helping people how teaching them how to brand themselves. Well, I think the the most important thing is in, in filmmaking, we talk about that the story that's the most personal is the most universal. And, you know, it, it just is the most personal story is the most universal because everybody can, everybody has those experiences. So in terms of branding, the person has to, it goes back to an Egyptian proverb, you know, you got to know yourself. You, you, you have to be able to say, what do I stand for? And whatever that is, whatever symbol is equated to that, whatever um, sit, uh, activities are related to that, to kind of own your space, because we're going back to being yourself, that's it. So if you're in high school, you know, you may not be the fastest guy in the world, but you're like, but I am a sure-handed receiver. That's what I do. If you throw it, I'm catching it period, point blank. If it's in my vicinity, <laughs> if it touches my fingertips, <laughs> I'm catching it. <laughs> if you're the wide receiver who maybe you, <laughs> you, you aren't the surest of hands, but <laughs> you're running a 4-3, you're like, nobody can catch me. <laughs> that's it. If you want somebody to stretch the field, I'm your guy. That's it. And that's all. I told my son, he's a small guy like me. When he started playing basketball, I said, look, you, you may not be the greatest shooter or anything else, but tell the coach that you'll rebound and hustle. And when he throw him in there, my boy's going to get his five fouls. <laughs> right. <laughs> he was going to be Tony out. He was going, he's going to D you up. So developing first from the athletic side, a notion of who you are and what you stand for. It doesn't mean that you can't grow from that, but there's a segmentation of everything. And people look for the slot receiver who does this, like Amendola or Wes Welker or someone else or Tavon Austin. They're that slot receiver. They do something. There's a guy who stretches the field. And if that's, um, you know, Megatron or whoever it is, there's a way in which people see things. It doesn't mean you can't be more things than that, but it means own what you are and you do, do well because somebody's going to be looking for that thing. You can't be all things to all people. Sometimes you just are, I am great at this, and you'll find a fit. Then in academics, it's going back to the same thing. I may not be the greatest chemist, but give me a paper and ask me to write it. I'm going to kill it. You know, I'm going to be creative. I'm going to subject verb agreement is going to be there. I'm going to use a beginning, middle and the end. It's going to introduce the characters. It's going to have conflict. There's going to be a resolution. I'm going to know what it is in film or writing or history. They're all related. I'm going to know that stuff so that when you transition now from either the high school to the college or from the college to the pros goes back to. You're coming onto the campus as somebody who has some specific sets of monikers, um, words, um, a sense of who you are. When you walk in the classroom, the teacher may say, hey, listen, I'm not the greatest chemist, but I'm going to sit in the front every day. And I'm going to be that guy who sits in the front and raises his hand. That's my branding in chemistry 101 this semester. I may not be the greatest person, but I'm in the front row raising my hand and the person's going to know me because in the end, when that grading comes down and maybe I'm between a C and a B, that instructor is going to say, but I know that's that young man or young woman who sits in the front and always asks questions. There's other people who got a better grade, but they don't do anything. This comes naturally and they don't work hard. I'm the person who sits in that class. So personal branding is not just about this big picture of like how you look and how you become in the world of Nike and Coca-Cola and everything else. But it's about being able to say, what are you as a person in high school? Um, am I a good person? Am I a person individuals can talk to? Am I a person who's uh, compassionate? Am I a person who's an activist on campus? Whatever those things are, those become part. It doesn't mean you can't be other things, but those become what you are. You stand on those things because in the world, people need those things. And you can always expand. You can always be more. But being able to say, what do I stand for? Which goes back to the first point. Personal is the most universal. Who are you? 
Where do you come from? What makes you you? Maybe you didn't go to the greatest, uh, you, you know, you lived in a challenging neighborhood. Well, that means you're a, a persevering person. That means you're a person who overcomes obstacles. That means you're a person who can stand in the storm and keep both feet about you. That's an attribute that I don't care if you're writing a college essay or talking to a coach. That characteristic, that brand, perseverance, die hard, whatever else, is something that everybody wants and needs. Because the college wants to know if you get an F in this class this semester, will you come back? If you get on probation, will you keep it going? If, uh, if, if, if the teacher marks up your paper, will you keep coming back? And on the field, what do they want to know? Hey, if we're down by 20 points, are you giving up? Or are you the person who's going to rally the whole team to get us moving forward? If you thought this was going to be some type of -of run-of-the-mill garden variety podcast show, you're in the wrong place. We're way past dry facts and dry science. What lies behind the Sports Mastery podcast show is my coaching program. My coaching program is designed to help the athlete reach their hopes and dreams, overcome pains and fears, and bust through all barriers and limitations. It doesn't take a PhD to teach confidence. It doesn't take a PhD to teach motivation. Every now and then, it's going to feel like I'm pulling teeth. But what I'm going to share with you is my high level systems and strategies that I've used with Olympic level athletes, division one athletes and NFL athletes. You can learn more about my high level systems and strategies at sportsmastery.com forward slash coaching. Get a free one hour complimentary consult. Visit that page and fill out the form. Thank you.